Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. With me today is Matthew John. He is a Alzheimer's advocate, and he's also somewhat like me, taking this journey and turning lemons into lemonade. And That's he's right. got he's got a, a product we're going to talk about. But first, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me, Jennifer. You're Great welcome. To be here. So you're very big on educating people. So why don't, why don't you introduce yourself and tell me what we talked about offline the other day? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, so my name is Matthew. Uh, I have been involved with uh, the Alzheimer's Association as a volunteer. And uh, unfortunately, this is the second time that I've been through a family experience with the disease uh, similar Jennifer, my grandparents, my grandmother had dementia, uh, and now, again, similar, my parent, my father has uh, Alzheimer's. So uh, I've really taken these lemons and really trying to figure out what I can do to have a positive impact, help spread the word about what Alzheimer's is, ways to potentially prevent it, how to mitigate it, how to manage it. Uh, And I think one of the most exciting things to me is getting to meet great people like you who are also unfortunately going through the same thing, but learning a lot about experiences and how to prepare to best help my family going forward. Yep, we're definitely on the same path that way. I have three generations. I don't know if I mentioned that the other day. My okay. great grandmother, my grandmother, my mom. So I am not going to be the fourth. Yep. I, I agree. That's a great mindset. And I stumbled on the right path. And I told, I've said this story before online or on the podcast. I used to weigh over 200 pounds, like 250 pounds and I'm five foot two. I know it's really easy to tell on an audio medium. And (laughs) I had a client who said, you have a family history of diabetes. You're overweight, you're screwed. And as I mentioned before, those were the best fighting words because once she said you're screwed, I was like, well, I'll show you. (laughs) which is a very (laughs) typical family trait. And it took a while. It took, I don't usually tell people how long it took because it took a long time to find the path that worked. And once I did, I lost the weight. I have, I've become an exercise fanatic, which before then walking the dogs was all pretty much all I did. And now when I get, when I have a week, like I've had this week with mom, My mom fell. She's been in the hospital. I've missed half my workouts or three-fifths of my workouts. And by the third day, I'm just like, you know, you can feel the stress physically. And so I did not know that losing the weight and changing the way I eat, which I did to avoid the diabetes, also probably helped prevent Alzheimer's. Yeah, there's a a saying that's pretty common right now, which is what is good for the heart is good for the brain. So focusing on cardiovascular health and what you can do for your heart really can have an impact to what ends up happening with your brain. Yeah, Yeah, and that's that's not an uncommon story too, is folks have diabetes, it leads straight to Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, vascular dementia. Uh, So staying steps ahead of that through diet and exercise like you have can really make a difference. And I did it right as I turned, I started on that journey right about the time I turned 40, which now I'm 53. So, you know, I, I was overweight for a very significant part of my adult life, but thankfully not anymore. Congratulations. (laughs) That's huge. That's really big. And I love, I, I always love it when I read and it's a sad statistic that very small percentage of people that maintain weight loss. I haven't maintained all hundred pounds, but part of that was when I turned 50, my dad ended up on hospice and he passed away and we ended up dealing with my mom and memory care. And beginning of 2017 was awful. (laughs) The first literally five, nine, like 10 weeks, the dog died. My daughter moved out. My dad died. We put my mom in memory care. And then there was all the residual things cleaning out their house, getting it ready to rent, and you know, just all that nonsense that you have to deal with. So it's like, I didn't That's need all lot. that stress, because I'm also a stress eater, on top of 
the things that happen when you turn 50 if you're a woman. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know, but it's okay. I'm still working on it. It'll happen. It just yes. it gets harder because I'm taking care of my mom. And, you know, like I said, this week I've missed three-fifths of my workouts. And I had to tell my husband on Wednesday that I was just like, literally, I felt like the spring inside was just tightly wound and was about to snap, which is really weird. Because I think back and to the times. I was going to say, an exercise can be a, a great outlet for that. So it's good you know that and that you're utilizing that. Uh, and stress can definitely pull you back from that at times. Yeah. It reminds me, it just just popped into my head. There was, I don't even know what was going on in my life, but I kind of not stormed in, but I, I, I went to the spin class, definitely a dark cloud hanging over my head. And obviously that showed on my face and the spin instructor who was also my personal trainer at the time. She's like, she goes, everything okay? And I'm like, it will be in an hour. And I rode the bike and I got off the spin bike after an hour. And I'm like, Ah, the world is safe from my murderous rage. <laughs> so it really does help a lot. You know, it, I didn't start out that way. I started out slowly. I didn't go six days a week. I went three. Now it's six on good, on a good week. It hasn't been That's six wonderful. for a while. Yeah. So it, in vigorous exercise, uh, what I've learned is that it can actually help generate new brain cells. So as you're going through an hour, spin class not only are you releasing some stress but you're also generating new brain cells that can help you cognitively function better as well so it gets your body in a better mood but then obviously the benefits to your brain are huge i did experience that one day not too too far back in the weeks where i was um the spin instructor that we used to have on mondays doesn't teach on mondays anymore so i was like between driving to the gym, getting there early enough to get the bike that I like, doing the hour class and driving was like almost <laughs> two hours. If I'm going to spend two hours, I'm going to get on my own bike and ride around the neighborhood. Right. I can burn off more calories in the same amount of time or fewer, you know, <laughs> still more calories, but less time. So I'm like right. zooming around the neighborhood, not my neighborhood, the, my old one. You have to go up a 10% grade hill, which I used to have a Honda Civic. And it used to, like, literally whine ee, all the way up the hill. People would, like, look at you. Oh, she's not flying up the hill. And it was better if I turned off the air conditioner. So that should give people an idea of what a 10% grade hill is like. <laughs> if you are not skinny like a professional cyclist, that kind of hill is hell. So yeah. I was in a different neighborhood that wasn't quite so bad. And I'm just zooming around probably about 14 to 16 miles an hour, which is, it's not ser terribly fast, but it's not slow. It's, a it's not speed. a recreational speed. And all of these ideas for the podcast, it was, they were, it was like popcorn, just popping in my head. Boop, boop, boop. Yeah. And I was like, I almost need to stop because I can't, you know, this is like so many ideas. By the time I get off my bike, I'm going to forget <laughs> half of them. So I'm like, I know how to make this stop. So then I just rode faster. So then you're anaerobic and you don't have time to think because you're trying to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> and then I rode up the big hill home and wrote down all the ideas. Yeah, so that's it is great. very true. I think it, and it also, I don't know, it gives you, well, it gives you endorphins. Right. Makes yep. you feel good once you're done. <laughs> and then it, it helps you sleep better too. And sleep is another important contributor to the effective cognitive function as well. So if you're wearing your body out, you're more likely to get into REM sleep. Uh, that REM sleep is good for your brain as well. So it all kind of ties together. And I think we're all used to hearing, you know, diet and exercise are good. I think the challenge and what's probably coming out more now and that's growing is the benefit to the brain. I think that's been underserved in the past. I think people have typically thought, oh, well, I'll get a six pack or I'll be thin or whatever it is. But really, it's more about cognitive performance and what that can do for you um, from that perspective. Yeah, it's definitely, I feel like since it's been, you know, a dozen years since I started on the journey of weight loss and I'm not going to become diabetic, I'll show you. I don't feel like I've had that quote middle age. And most of my listeners know that I have a grandmother that's just about 102 or probably will right. be by the time this episode comes out. So, <laughs> you know, she's 102, I'm 53. <laughs> That makes me Halfway a teenager there. still. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> you know, 
and sometimes I think about, you know, 49 more years, oh my Lord. <laughs> right, yeah. But as long as they're good ones, you know, like I said, I got this, uh, how old is he? I think he's 31 years older than me. So he's 884. And he rides his bike all over the place, walks his dog, you know, he's doing great, you know, versus other people that we've met. You know, my dad didn't make it to 80. My mom is 77 with advanced Alzheimer's. You know, I don't want to be like them. I would like to be like my friend or my grandmother. Right. So, right. so what do you, how do you give me some exam? I know some stuff on sleep. Right. Because I learned a lot going through the weight loss journey. One of the tricks, tips I learned just recently is, you know, we, we need a really dark, quiet, cool bedroom. Mm -hmm. And they say if you hold your hand <laughs> up about six to eight inches away from your face and you can see the outline of your hand, your room is not dark enough. Oh, when wow. we moved into this house, you know, about six or seven weeks ago, there were no blinds on the windows and all of the neighbors seemed to have lights on in their backyard. <laughs> and we went from a house that had nobody in the back. There was nothing, no city. It was all open space. It was dark right. to neighbors with lights on. I was like, I am not getting decent sleep. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm sure most folks who are listening to this have been through an experience where they're not getting decent sleep and just the, uh, you know, literally if you're not getting sleep, you can think you're losing your mind. Right. Uh, so no surprise at dark, cold places where you can rest well will invigorate what's going on in your brain. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think I was telling you the other day that if I get one really bad night's sleep, only takes one, I wake up and my brain is going, let's have a donut or some Danish. Right. Or, and it wants all of this crappy, you know, what your brain thinks is, you know, quick, fuel food right it is right i don't right. think eating a donut is going to make me feel better if i'm really tired so i just think it's funny because i know that when my brain is saying you know let's have a donut let's have some danish <laughs> it's like no you need a nap <laughs> <laughs> right yeah what's uh interesting is you know as i self-assess myself in interactions with my wife or my family or my friends or colleagues uh typically i figure one of a couple of things is going on if I'm not feeling well. I haven't eaten enough, uh, I haven't slept enough, or uh, I need to drink some water. It's one of those three things. And if I do one of those three things, like my kind of emotional state can completely be different if I can sit down and have a healthy snack. Uh, you know, 30 minutes later, I'm a different person. And that's probably true for a lot of people too. You feel great when you eat that donut, but probably... 30 minutes afterwards, you're hungry for something else because it didn't really satiate what your brain was yeah. looking for. Another donut. <laughs> right, exactly. That's yep. one of the reasons I don't eat them because you eat one donut and it's like, oh, I'll take another. And I did read, not recently, but in the somewhat recent past, read an article on why certain foods are really hard to only eat, you know, small amounts like potato chips or pizza. Mm -hmm. Now, my husband and I, my husband's really bad. He goes all the time. We'll go to extreme pizza and get a slice. I get a slice and a salad. Now, I don't understand how they do their math because their slice is actually two. And <laughs> probably 98% of the time I eat one slice and bring the other one home. Only time I eat two is if we do that at dinner time and I'm really hungry. I try to only eat one, but sometimes at dinner time, one and a salad is kind of light. But right. it's, it's the simple carb and fat that your body's like it lights up all your happy places right. in your brain because that, that that specific combination lights up all the happy parts in your brain which is just why you eat a bag of chips or four or five slices of pizza when you really only wanted to you know, and i think learning those things and knowing that there are certain combinations that trigger you know it's not that i don't have self control or you know i'm just I'm, you know, being bad or however we negatively talk about sometimes when we don't eat right. Like when I give in right. to my brain and have a donut or something, I don't usually have donuts, but as an example, if you understand that certain food combinations trigger your brain, like, sure. a, you know, a drug, like feed me more of that. Yeah, no, sugar actually, uh, 
activates the same part of the brain that cocaine does. And so if you, if you think about that, you know, both white powdery substances, they're activating the same part of the brain. The brain craves that sort of attention. And once you start it, you want more of it. So it, be, it goes from a, a will issue to like, it's not even a thinking thing. Your body just, like you're saying, you're not getting enough sleep or you have one donut, you want another one. You just want to fill that craving. So it's a really tough cycle to break. And if you've broken it, I'm sure you've experienced and others have experienced, once you taste it again, it kind of kickstarts it all over again and it's hard to curb. So it's really about trying to, how do you maintain that consistently by keeping good things around that aren't going to be tempting, right? If you're not buying donuts the night before and you don't have any in the house, you're probably going to be in better position to have a good morning than if you have a bunch of donuts laying around. Very true. Although I do now live within walking distance of a donut shop. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe get a little cardiovascular exercise in. That could- yeah, it's about what, half a mile? Okay. Three That's quarters good. of a mile, not very far. It still would be better to walk to the donut shop than to drive <laughs> over there. <laughs> a lot of reasons not to drive that short distance. Um, I usually try to eat fruit after lunch so that I do not have the craving for a cookie or sugar right. or whatever, which I have told people is genetic because my maternal grandfather did not feel a meal was complete until he had dessert. I don't know mm. if that included breakfast or not. But lunch, and they they were really good when I was late teens, college age. Yeah, college age, because they started traveling right after I graduated from high school. They would have the processed, packaged desserts. Wow, yeah. yeah. It, was, are... it was the 80s. <laughs> yep. I don't know if anybody knew better then, but I didn't. Right. So, and the other thing, I never thought... Next time I, my brain is going, let's have chocolate, Jen. Let's have some sweet. I'm going to have some water first and see if that helps. You know, that's a very common situation too, is uh, a lot of eating is actually a function of being dehydrated. And so people tend to eat as opposed to hydrate. And there's research out there that shows that if you're drinking your eight to 10 glasses of water on a daily basis, uh, which can be tough to do but your brain function can be up to 30% higher than if you're not doing that. So that's, that's a pretty substantial difference, right? So if you're thinking you're hungry, if you grab a glass of water and have a glass of water, you might be satiated afterwards, prevent the donut binges and also help improve your brain function at the same time. So it's, there's so much out there. I mean, I, I've been amazed as I've kind of started this journey again with my dad over the last three years, how much I was doing and how much I can do differently. That's going to help position me. Like it sounds like you're positioning yourself as you're drinking water uh, (laughs) to try and not be the next one in my family to get this disease or to, you know, operate at a higher level as well. You know, I I run my own business. um, I volunteer a lot. You know, I've got a lot going on. So my mental capacity is really important. And if I'm not operating at a high level, things aren't going to happen. I'm not out there, you know, lifting weights and making a living by lifting things. I've got to have a effective brain in order to do my job well and my responsibilities. That is very true. I only drink water and tea. And I did a whole episode on tea and brain health because I ran across an article on how tea is actually good for your brain. And right. why, and me being, my family laughs because I am extremely fussy about how, you cannot make tea if you don't boil water. <laughs> I mean, it just, that is, it's, it's like, I'm assuming that you can't really make coffee without boiled water either, but restaurants will throw a tea bag in water that's not hot enough and it just doesn't taste right. Yeah. It drives me bananas. Right. <laughs> I even have my own portable travel electric kettle because I'm a tea snob. <laughs> Wow, I've never heard that before. That's that is a tea snob. I, it there's is. not a lot of tea snobs out there, but I'm glad there's a growing group. That sounds good. And I was really surprised. I knew that coffee and tea, the caffeine in them is actually beneficial to your brain, which was counterintuitive to what I had thought. 
And so the researching the tea and the brain health was really fascinating. It was like, yay right. for me. <laughs> it's like <laughs> I didn't even have to change anything other than what I put in it is not good. But right. Yep. You know, I figure I have cleaned up my diet and we didn't eat unhealthy, but we've cut out a lot of fats and a lot of uh, simple carbohydrates, you know, white pastas, white, right. you know, white rice and stuff. My husband really likes white rice better. If I have time, I make my own pasta because it tastes so much better. And I use a, a whole white whole wheat. It just tastes fantastic. Now I'm going to make myself hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Drink your water. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's like, it's probably what it is since I did the bike ride this morning. Right. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's amazing. And I don't think I've ever told people the way I, you know, a lot of people like, oh my gosh, how, a lot of people at my gym did not believe that I did not have gastric bypass. I did not. So what I did That's... is I just slowly changed how I ate. And now I can't go back because my, right. my system goes on revolt. Right. And, and did you notice a difference in your, your brain function as you were physically changing and losing that hundred pounds? Um, I've thought about that and it's hard to know since I had just turned 40 or was right around 40 when I started. Um, I think that it didn't diminish with age for sure. I mean, not that from right. 40 to 53 is huge. I mean, it's 13 years, but still. You know, about 12 at this point. Um, I've noticed, <laughs> this is kind of funny. I noticed since I started doing the podcast that I feel like my brain is more alive because I had yeah. to do a lot of dynamic learning. Right. I, I'm also a photographer, but I've been a photographer for 27 years. And I was very proud of the fact that, you know, like one day, <sighs> this is hysterical. Gal came over to do a portrait and the power went out. Well, that makes it difficult <laughs> when your studio lights don't light up. And I right. said, oh, but I have the backup uh, gear just drove off in the dry out of the driveway with my daughter in my car. Well, dang it. Okay, so now plan B is no longer an option. Okay, plan C. So, I mean, and plan C was definitely not as good looking as plan A would have been. But right. I, man I made it work. And I was very happy with, you know, I could roll with the punches because I've been doing this so long. And then after I started doing the podcast and I had to learn a whole ton of stuff, none of it was terribly complicated, but it was all different. It was like, Oh, I kind of feel like the brain yeah, is more, more alive. Are going on. Well, and, and uh, I know one of the things that we wanted to talk about today is signs of dementia or Alzheimer's and cognitive decline and the ability to not problem solve is one of the signs. So, in your situation, putting yourself in a position where you're having to continually learn and get exposure to new things, again, you're creating more neural connections in your brain. So it's going to allow your brain to develop and grow as opposed to not being a situation where you have to problem solve and doing the same thing every day. That stimulation can really have an impact. And that's, that's one of the top signs that if you're not able to do that problem solving anymore that's a, a sign that maybe you're headed in the wrong direction you should take some steps like you have you do a podcast you're getting out and exercising you're drinking water all of that is is really important it can make a big difference to what's going on in your brain i like it when people will say you know like they lost their keys and then they find them and they're like oh god is that alzheimer's like no <laughs> i mean if i hear somebody at the gym say that or the store I'm like right. no I just insert myself and I'm like, if you misplace something and you can't retrace your steps to find them, I was just talking to the director of the memory care where my mom lives and I misunderstood her. And she said she looked for her purse for an hour and a half. And I said, that's not a good thing. And she goes, it was because right. a resident moved it. And I'm like, oh, that's a different story. <laughs> yeah, that is a lot different. Great. Yeah, somebody else moves your stuff and you can't find it, but you know. <laughs> And I always thought, well, I don't misplace things because I'm very particular. So it's like, you know, certain things go in certain places the way I don't have to yep. think about it. Well, yeah, if your organization is, is one way to help your brain be able to retain other things as well, right? If you spend your whole day trying to find where your keys are put, not a very productive day, but if you can organize things in a way, it allows your brain to do other more advanced things like problem solve what to do when the lights go out in the middle of a photo shoot yeah. uh 
so yeah, misplacing items is another sign, but to your point, that's not necessarily like, there are times where I forget my keys. I don't think that at this point I have Alzheimer's. Uh, but th- what, one of the scary things is that Alzheimer's and other dementia are showing that it can actually start to take place 20 to 30 years before some of these signs start to show up. So mild cognitive impairment or early onset, there are folks in their 40s and 50s that are diagnosed with these diseases and more than likely they probably started getting them in their 20s. So if you're going back to the 80s and thinking about some of those packaged snacks, um, packaged uh, snacks like that with all those added sugars that include ingredients that you can't pronounce, um, (laughs) that could start your path towards what ends up being Alzheimer's or dementia. Well, I guess I'll have to thank my mom because I got homemade desserts all the time. Like I had a best friend, she loved Chips Ahoy cookies. And I had to like almost never eaten them because my mom always made great ones at home. Tasted much (laughs) better than Chips Ahoy. And mom made all kinds of desserts, brownies, cakes, all kinds of, all lots of sugar. My mom's side of the family loves the sugar. So I have a trick that I learned while on the journey of weight loss is you can replace half of the butter. Well, you can replace all the butter, but in a typical Toll House cookie recipe, any cookie recipe, especially if it calls for two sticks of butter, just really good. I can't eat that much butter. Replace it with half of the butter with silken tofu. Hmm. The flavor is the same. You you can't make them crunchy. So if you like the, the crispy cookies, this won't work. Um, but they're soft. The, my, my husband loves them. Everybody that's ever had them just loves them. And what's cool is because there's protein in the tofu and f- some fiber, you have one cookie and it's like, oh, man, you really don't want a second fills, one. Like you really you don't a want bit one. more. Right. Mm-hmm. It, yeah, yeah it fills you up. Yeah, you have that with some of your tea or some of your water or both. I'm usually double fisting it sometimes. Right. <laughs> and, you know, now I just have to find a replacement for some of the fake sugars that I put in my tea. Yeah. That's my next um, step. That's the one my, thing that I'm still bad at. So uh, one of my go-tos there uh, from a sweetener perspective is organic honey. I think that can be really useful. It's full of minerals and nutrients that help cognitive function. Um, so that's a, that's a good option there. And from a baking perspective, I think a lot of people love baking like your mom has and it sounds like you have adding things in and using like bananas uh, or dates, you know, they're very easy to mash up and they create, they bring things together, but they have that sweetness and they have the fiber with them, typically low on the glycemic level as well. So it's not going to be the spike in your blood sugar. Um, Small changes like that can make a big difference. And I'd say even for Toll House, swap those out for 100% chocolate, cacao nibs, in same way, you'll probably have two or three of them and you'll be like, oh, I don't want six or seven of them because you're the way your body processes them is going to be different. And then also potentially the energy that your brain and your body get from it is much more long lasting than that spike that you would get if you had the tool house recipe. So there's all kinds of uh, great resources out there. If uh, you or others aren't familiar with it, the mind diet is a growing trend. Uh, which has all kinds of good recipes. Uh, There's Mind Diet books. There's a book out there called uh, Brain Food that has some recipes in it um, that give all these tips and tricks for people to use so that slight changes, you'll get used to the taste. I I can promise you that. Uh, But it's so much better for you and your being and mindset will be different because you're making changes like that. That is very true. And sometimes we just have to, we just have to just try. My husband and I, a couple years ago, uh, did the Blue Apron subscription. And we, both of us did not think we liked sweet potatoes. And one of the, one of the first meals, everything about it we liked, but we're like, "Eh, I don't know about the mashed sweet potatoes. So I like literally take my fork. I'm like, okay, I'm going in. I scoop up some. I taste it. I'm like, hmm not hating it, take a second bite. And my next statement was, 
who the hell killed me for sweet potatoes all these years? These are good. <laughs> right. I'm like, hello. And I'm like, I think it was one of those Thanksgivings. My dad right. was from the Midwest originally, and I think somebody had the sweet potatoes with the brown sugar and the marshmallows. Now, I right. told you, my mom's, side of, yeah, my mom's side of the family, we love our sugar, but that's just gross. So yeah. I don't remember ever eating sweet potatoes any other way. So now that we've had them it. a lot. I've, had, I've yeah. got a chili recipe that includes them, just different things. But one of the dishes that I made about a year or so ago is um, it's a faux fried rice made with the frika grain. Frika is F-R-E-E-K-A-H. Okay. And I don't think most people would realize that it's not brown rice. And it's, it's kind of lighter than brown rice. And it's this particular recipe is vegetarian. So it's got an egg and tons of vegetables in it and this grain. And it's, it's like having vegetarian fried rice. Of course, I add chicken because the egg is not quite enough protein for me. Right. But it's delicious for lunch. I've, I have some in the fridge now. I need to finish up before it goes bad. Yeah. And, and, and meal, you just I have think to, meal prepping is really helpful too, right? We're, there's only two of us now, so our meal prepping <laughs> is trying to make sure that we have – well, we always have stuff here to eat, but, you know, if the meat is frozen, that's a challenge. It's right. Kind of plan like I asked this morning at breakfast, what are we going to do for dinner? So my husband's planning on that. and So you have to do a little planning, but our life is enough chaotic sometimes that if we try to plan too much, we end up wasting food, which makes me crazy. Right. But yes, right. meal prepping makes it a lot easier to eat healthy, keeping healthy stuff in your fridge. Like I have um, bags of baby carrots. I eat those with a sandwich at lunchtime. That's I don't great. miss potato chips for that. Yep. And they have a bunch of, uh, oh, what's the name of the carotenoids, I think is how you pronounce it. Yeah, um, that sounds right. Which, um, are really, again, helpful for your brain function. Another interesting thing that I, I've learned is that neurotransmitters are created by one thing and that's our nutrition. So if you're not eating the right things, your neurotransmitters are not going to function the way that they need to and they're not going to exist. So eating some carrots is going to help you as opposed to eating some salty chips that have been, you know, deep fried in something. Uh, it really makes a difference. And I, I eat sweet potatoes. I probably go through a bag of sweet potatoes on a, on a weekly basis. Uh, make it with salmon uh, leafy greens. That's a standard meal for me to try and help improve my function. And that's my one other downfall is I do not like anything that came out of the ocean. I do not like any fish period. <laughs> so I do take a fish oil supplement. That's good. Or it's actually a krill oil. That way I'm not burping up fish flavor. Cause that would be the end of taking those. <laughs> but I don't know what my problem is. Multi-generational Californian access to all kinds of seafood and I don't want any of it. <laughs> yep. That makes sense. And I have tried, that is the one thing I've tried it enough times as an adult in the recent past, tried so I'm like, okay, you know, now I'm liking sweet potatoes. I like other things that I didn't think I liked. So let me try some fish. Nope. Still don't like that. <laughs> like, I don't know what it is, but you, you said, um, the greens, a lot right. of people greens. Yep. don't like kale. If you do not like kale, try collard greens because yep. they're very similar, but they, we liked collard greens much better than kale and they're a lot easier to prepare. You don't have to, it's a lot less preparation of the leaves. Right. Yeah. The, the one thing I've been doing and that I, I've helped my father implement too is like one salad a day. And again, I think growing up and younger, I always just think, okay, that's good to like help my body get in better shape. But the, brain benefits of leafy greens are just astounding. The vitamin E that's in spinach um, is a, an essential vitamin that your brain needs to function properly. And you can do all, I, I like to think fun things with salads. Like you can put all kinds of toppings on them, uh, you know, just as a base and use it like people typically use pizza, right? You can put all kinds of things on top of a pizza. You can put all kinds of things on top of a salad, but getting those, greens into your system can really make a difference. <laughs> I forgot to close the office door. So I don't know if everybody <laughs> just heard my husband came home and he yelled hello. 
<laughs> That's <Hello>. okay. Um, <laughs> so there's a reason that you've been doing a lot of this nutritional research besides the right. fact that you don't want to be a third generation, like I don't want to be a fourth generation. So what is right. this that you've been working on that's coming out soon? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, so the, the name of the product that I've developed is called Remembar, uh, and it's brain food to help cognitive function. Uh, kind of the backdrop to it is my parents came out to visit my wife and I when we were living in Dallas, Texas. And when my dad and mom got there, my dad was kind of out of sorts. It was a long day of travel. They didn't sleep well. Uh, their hydration was not where it needed to be. So my mom and I started doing research, like what are, what are some good brain foods that he could eat that would help get him into a better position? Uh, he slept for a day, you know, we started playing music and if, I don't know if that's one of the topics that you've covered so far, but music is an awesome category if folks don't know the benefit, especially for folks that are suffering with Alzheimer's or dementia, music is a, a terrific avenue to reawaken people. Um, but we got, we had music and sleep and hydration going. So we came up with this idea of researching what foods we could put together. And we came up with what we called at that time, brain bars. Uh, which basically included all scientifically backed ingredients from oats, berries, nuts, uh, seeds to help improve cognitive function. And uh, as a volunteer for the Alzheimer's Association, uh, ending last season in some fundraising, I, I run my own business now. And I thought, you know what, I think I can help create a more sustainable revenue source to nonprofits that are doing great work like the Alzheimer's Association and combine that with getting more insight out there and more products out there that people could utilize like my mom and I created in the kitchen. So Remember is a scientifically backed ingredient nutrition bar that includes uh, protein, nuts, uh, fruits, seeds, and fiber. It's got a really good balance between them. And the goal with it is to help educate people, but also to, you know, if you're looking for a snack with your tea, pick up a Remember because it's going to help your cognitive function. A lot of the, what I call nutrition bars out there, if you look at what is in them and you look at the ingredient profile, I think you'd be astounded at how much sugar and how many things are in it that really, in my opinion, are not nutritious. So kind of selfishly trying to create something for my father has turned into this idea in a product that is close to launching that's going to be able to help raise money for nonprofits, educate people, and also hopefully be part of their daily habit in a way that you've described changing, whether it's their physical body or their mental state through proper nutrition. Well, so I definitely it's really exciting. I'm sure. I'm going to definitely need those at four o'clock every day <laughs> I, I need a small snack. So I can make that happen. Good. I can make that happen. Because <laughs> I'm, you know, it's, sometimes it's fruit and sometimes it's, you know, like a little cheese stick or something. But it's like, sometimes it's just like, you just need something easy to eat while you're sitting at the computer working on editing a podcast or photos right. or whatever. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a terrific snack. I had one for a snack two days ago and I, I was very again satiated i felt great afterwards i didn't feel sluggish afterwards um the taste is really good too we have two flavors that we're starting off with one is the original that i was kind of describing that my mom and i came up with a couple years ago and then the second one uh you saw me before we started eating some dark chocolate it's our chocolate recipe um so it uses 100 percent cacao uh, and cacao chips in it, so it has a, a good chocolate profile to it. So, and whichever fruit, way you like to go. Oh, chocolate all the way. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm assuming the fruit helps sweeten up those cacao. But because I've had some, what is it? I think I had an 80 something percent cacao bar. It was um, right. I had orange fruit trees in my old house, and the winter 2017 into 2018. 2018 okay. into 2019 yeah 2018 into 2019 i had so many oranges on my tree it was like 
if I ate one more orange, I'm going to be orange. And I was literally <laughs> find, trying to find recipes that used up oranges because I'm like, I can't eat any more freaking oranges. I'm like, eh. <laughs> so I made an um, chocolate, an orange chocolate upside down cake. So think of pineapple oh, wow. upside down cake, but it was the cake part was chocolate with the oranges. It was delicious. That sounds and really good. It was really good. And it, it uh, and I also made an orange sherbet, orange sorbet, excuse me. And it called for grating a really dark chocolate on top of the, the, the sorbet. On Great. top of the sorbet, excellent. You take a bite <laughs> of it, it was like, ooh, <laughs> eat some sugar with it. <laughs> Yeah, so there is there is some sweetness in uh, the remembar. So sweeten it up with we have dates in the remembars and also cherries in the remembars in the chocolate one. So it's a good combination. It has uh, almond butter in it and the protein. So it's a really good balance okay. between. Yeah, right. You're making hungry. me hungry again. <laughs> Almost four o'clock our time anyway. So it's about that time of day for you. Yep, definitely. So, yeah, so when really do when do you think those are launching? Uh, within the next quarter. So I'm going through the, hopefully the final round of prototypes. We've made some adjustments, gotten some insights from customers on what they like about it, what should change. Uh, I didn't mention this specifically earlier, but I'm working with nutrition specialists and dietitians. Uh, I have a doctor that's looking at it who is also very deep into brain health. So I'm really trying to do everything I need to do to make sure this product is as good as it can be to be brain food to help cognitive function. Um, so going through that process right now, but likely within the next month, I'll start taking pre-orders. Um, the website is rememberbrainfood.com. So hopefully easy to remember, uh, pun somewhat intended there. Uh, and what we're also- me, I have lots of, all my websites are long, long addresses for various reasons. <laughs> None of which are good. <laughs> Just um, I, when I went and went to get the domain address for Fading Memories, I learned the hard way that Fading Memories is a, a band and a movie and a book. Uh, and so FadingMemories.com was thirty-five thousand plus dollars. Yep, not getting I was that like, one. I must be reading that screen wrong. Let me go have some lunch. And I came back, I'm like, <laughs> still almost 36000 I'm not spending $36,000 yeah, on a domain. Not on a website. Wow. Nope. So it's Fading Memories Podcast. So it's like very long. There you go. And my photography well, one things, one's long too. <laughs> one of the things we've done um, is we have a, a text-in service. So right now, if you text in a purple heart from your mobile phone to 24365, It'll send you some details. So try to make it easy as well. The purple heart coming from obviously purple being a, a dominant color, color for Alzheimer's. Uh, and 24365 just kind of representing how often we're available. If you need any insight on nutrition, you can reach out to us. And one of the other things that we're doing that I don't think I mentioned to you the other day is we are building out a service as well where it's not just going to be a product that you can eat, but if you want to get insight into other things that you can do to help your brain health like we've been talking about whether it's sleep or exercise or you know you don't like eating salmon or fish what can you do in replacement of that uh we're working to build a network of nutrition experts who can walk people through some changes that would help them get to a place where hopefully they're mitigating their potential for getting alzheimer's or some other dementia which is really important. And even, you know, like a lot of people are like, well, I don't want to know if I have Alzheimer's or not because there's nothing right. they can do. I was at, let's see, it was in, to the Toronto. The, um, this should tell you how this topic is becoming more and more mainstream, for lack of a better term. Right. I was at the Toronto International Convention for Rotary in 2018. And one of the sessions I went to was um, brain health and peace. And I thought only <laughs> somebody from Berkeley, California would set those two together. And <laughs> the main speaker was from Berkeley. So I'm not hey, just being disparaging, <laughs> but what they were pointing out was her and then three brain researchers from Brazil. But they were saying the number, and I should have looked this up, but I didn't. I think there's like 10 million cases of, 
Alzheimer's worldwide every year. And if we can prevent people from getting it for five years, the, it drops right. that number dramatically. Yeah. And so, you know, it's like, like my mom is 77 and my grandmother's almost 102. So it, if I have the, well, let's say at 53, I would probably already have, have it if I, even if I wasn't showing signs, but if I could prevent it for five years and not get it right. in my seventies yep. or eighties, more right. power to me. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's the right concept. So uh, right now, particularly we're going through the coronavirus epidemic and pandemic, right? So yep. there's this phrase out there right now with social distancing and everything about flattening the curve. Mm -hmm. That same concept of flattening that pandemic, not necessarily to lessen the number of people that get it, but to spread it out over a long period of time is exactly the same thought with Alzheimer's because or other dementia, because one of the most prevalent factors is age relative to these diseases. And so if you can push that off, three years, five years, 10 years, lifespans, you know, eventually not everybody's going to leave, live to be over a hundred. Uh, but rather than getting Alzheimer's at age 65, if you push that to 75, you know, there's some mortality that happens between those years. So yeah, flattening the curve by taking preventive measures can really be impactful. Um, and the other thing I would say is I, I know there's, I think, commonly this thought that there's not a cure for Alzheimer's. Um, but I think one of the exciting things for me is I just spent over a month with my parents uh, helping take care of my dad. He's kind of in the moderate stages of Alzheimer's right now, but we kind of focused on these areas that we've been talking about is like, wake up in the morning, drink a glass of water, eat a healthy meal um, that doesn't have a bunch of sugars in it, had a, you know, um, chia seeds in it and blueberries, which are shown to have positive cognitive health, um, go out for a walk every day and focus on sleep, diet, exercise, socialization. Uh, and my mom is telling me now as I kind of check in and see how things are going that my dad is acting more like himself now than he was before my visit. So to see even a moderate uptick in kind of his behavior and his ability to interact to me is encouraging. So I think as anybody starts to see these signs, whether it's forgetting your keys or you can't problem solve as well, that that's the time to really think about what are the lifestyle things that I can start doing, getting on a bike and riding, changing your diet, you know, getting to a dark, cold place so you can sleep better, um, de-stressing, all that can really have a big impact uh, and flatten the curve. But also I think there's, you know, I'm probably more optimistic now that I can help have a positive impact on my dad's cognitive function than I have been in the past, especially given the time that I just spent with him recently. That's, that's a fascinating thing to hear. And then I'm going to piggyback on that a little bit is I'm sure you know that, 18% of care, family caregivers pass away before their person they're caring for. And 65% right. of us end up hospitalized before our right. family members pass away. So right. just your dad having a slight uptick, being a little bit more like his old self, definitely helping your mom. Yep, absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think that's part of the challenge with this disease is, you know, you're slowly seeing people, whittle away and go going from being able to, you know, my dad studied math, uh, was working towards MBA, worked for General Electric for almost 40 years, was really successful. You know, and now he's asking like, you know, where does this cup go? And he's asked me five times within the last two minutes, you know, that it's really tough to see that. And then I know you were mentioning the other day that the further down the road, like your mom's at now not being able to feed herself or soiling herself like that, that's really tough to watch and emotionally straining. So there, I think it's equally as important as a caregiver to be focused on these things as well, right? So if, if you're a caregiver who's intimately involved with taking care of somebody with one of these diseases, the more you can exercise to de-stress, the more you can eat properly and sleep better, you can make that a habit. 
you're going to take care of yourself first. And then hopefully that'll translate to, again, at least flattening the curve in which somebody may progress with a disease like this. Next, I don't know if I mentioned it the other morning. You know, we've been on this journey with my mom for like 20 years. Yeah, it's a long disease. It is very long. I haven't met too many, actually, no, but I've I've heard of two other people, one at about the same same length of time, and then there's one other person who um, I've heard her mom lived for 30. Now, maybe they saw it way, way early. You know, I've mentioned multiple, multiple times on the podcast that I think my mom started showing signs in the summer of 1995. She was formally diagnosed in September of 2011. And so what is that? 15, 14 years? Right. You know, and it's easy to look back and go, hmm, I think, you know, some of these things she was doing might have been early signs, but they were very easily dismissed to, you know, not paying attention, getting distracted, being stressed, being tired, you know, very easy to dismiss, but, you know, looking back, I'm, I'm not sure that those were the reasons that she was having the issues. She'd take orders from clients and not write down due dates and instructions or anything useful. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And that those happened are, more and more. Right. So very disruptive. It's, yeah. It's, it's very stressful for us. Cause it's like, I got right. to the point where she was, she would chit chat with clients a lot. And if I heard her talking, just shooting the breeze, I would go out and, Oh, so, you know, what are we doing for Matthew today? And I, I'd, I'd kind of, take the order and look at it. And then if there was a question, it could kind of easily ask the client, Oh wait, mom didn't write. When was, when, when, when are we supposed to have this ready for you? It was very easy to fix the problem before it happened. If I catch her in the middle of chit chatting, and it's easy, you know, you're talking, you know, you're talking about the kids, the grandkids, whatever. And the next thing you know, they run out the door. You're like, ah, I forgot to write down the due date. Oh, it's, uh, it's tomorrow or whatever. Yeah, you know, it's very easy to dismiss, but it happened more and more. And then one day she didn't recognize right. her own handwriting. That was fun. Yeah. Wow. That was in like, it was before 2005. So it was between 2000 and 2004. I don't remember exactly which year it was because, you know, those aren't the kind of things you write down in your journal. <laughs> right. <laughs> but maybe I right. should have. Those are really tough moments. Really tough moments. Yeah, because when I pointed it out that, yes, it was her handwriting, because she said it was one of the employees, and I showed her, I'm like, um, employees' handwriting, very loopy and circular, and mom's was very, I mean, they weren't even remotely similar. Mom's was very angular. And I said, this is so-and-so's handwriting. This is yours. And she goes, I don't want to end up like my mother. Pfft, stomped off. And I was like, uh, murder is illegal. I don't know what other <laughs> options you're giving me here. I mean, it was just, it was literally like, I don't know right. what to say. And I think we just ignored it from that point on, but I knew at that point. And so that was, let's just say 2004. Then she wasn't diagnosed till 2011. Right. That's a so long was, time. Yeah. She, everybody in the family knew by the time it was formally diagnosed, she was already in mid stages, but yeah. you know, if she had eaten better, and exercised more. She was, she never had to worry about her weight. Like I did. That comes from my dad's side of the family. Yeah. Um, and Oh, I, I think I told you this the other day, she would drink two liters of diet Coke every day. Yeah. That's probably not helpful. Nope. I think that's poison for your brain. I don't even like yeah. soda anymore. Well, so. and, and to your point about the, the exercising for the body, I mean, if you look at somebody with mild cognitive impairment or early onset like if i showed you a picture of my father you wouldn't think anything was wrong with him right uh and so again i think that's where there can be a shift in perspective on the challenges you can look at your muscles you can look at you know how much fat you have on your body you can look at how much you weigh it's really tough to tell how well your brain's performing so exercise for physical is definitely helpful but even for me, uh, you know, I'm 5'11", 160 pounds. I, I don't need to exercise necessarily for my physical stature. I need to exercise because my brain needs it. I need to get that oxygen flowing. I need to generate new brain cells. Those are some, I would say, motivating reasons for me to get out every day. And for folks that think that they're in shape and might think, oh, I don't need to exercise, 30 minutes. Like, go for a walk, break it up, 15 minutes twice, get your heart rate up, get the oxygen flow into your brain, build those new brain cells. That, that can really make a difference. And I think the other 
perspective shift, in my opinion, is it's not really an old person's disease, right? They're finding more and more ability to diagnose this earlier. So the cases of early onset are growing, earlier mild cognitive impairment. And as I referenced earlier, it really can start as early as 20 to 30 years earlier. So it's not, there's no like, oh, I, I can wait till I'm 50 or I can wait till I'm 40 or wait till I'm 30 to start worrying about my brain health. It really needs to be a lifestyle approach all the way through adulthood to help prevent this disease from coming on later in your life. And I think it'll help you be successful too, right? I mean, one of the distinguishing factors of humans is we have bigger brains than most of our animal counterparts. And so if we're not taking care of our brain, we're really not any better than some of our animal counterparts, right? That's, that's a really essential organ for us to take care of. That is true. You know, and everybody, you know, they want to live, they want to live a good and the long life. And you know, a lot of people right. are like, well, as long as I, you know, like my, my grandmother, who I said is 102 is mostly blind from glaucoma, which has wow. been like the last 41 years. And it was the last 15 that it's been significant. So it's been a long time, Lord. But just in the last year, now she's starting to have problems hearing. And mm -hmm. it's like, yep. she says getting old is not for wimps. <laughs> that is very true. And when she, what happened is she had most of her vision in one eye and she, having grown up, in, grown up poor in the depression and getting married in the late 30s, and they were poor, so my grandmother is very reluctant to spend any of the money that my grandfather left her, which has been significant. She was pulling weeds, and she slipped and hit her face on her good eye and oh, stretched gosh. the retina. So I thought, oh, you know, my grandmother painted. She likes to watch the sunset. She's very, very visual like I am. I thought, right. nope, she's going to just, you know, give it up. Nope, she's still here. Wow. You know, and I can't imagine what it's like not to be able to see much. And now you can't hear too well. <laughs> like, yeah. You and know, stimulating that way, um, kind of going to one of the things we talked about is socialization, you know, having the ability to, like you're saying, even on the podcast, I think one of the benefits is you're, you're talking and you're engaging and you're learning new things, not only how to, you know, slice and dice the podcast and all that, but the social engagement, learning from people that can go a long way and the more you do of that the more beneficial so it's got to be really challenging if you can't read you can't see and your hearing's going to get that brain stimulation yeah you know and at 102 well she said um right after my dad died it was her oldest son that she was striving for 105 so we'll see she got three <laughs> more years i don't know that's pretty I, ambitious that's yeah awesome. you know and it's and her husband died in December of 97, so wow. it's been a long haul. <laughs> but I want to live that long just because there are things happening right now that I would like to see through the lens of history. Right. You know, like, I grew up in the 80s, California. You know, I don't remember Reagan being our governor. I think that might have been before my time or really early in my time. I'm hearing from the other room. It was in the 60s. I was born in November 66, so that's only partly helpful. Um, but I remember, you know, Germany being east and west with the Berlin Wall, and that's gone. Right. Um, right. Just There's just things when you look back and, you know, space shuttle blowing up when I was in early college. Just various things, you know, like the AIDS crisis. Now we don't even hear about that right. anymore. It's just like, right. so I want to see how current things play out how history judges them. So I need to live, right. you know, another 40 years just so I can see all that. Right. So I got to no. have my brain so that right. I can process that information. And so you can share it with others, right? And what it was like to live through those experiences, oh Lord. right? I don't think I'll be podcasting it in 40 years, but you never know. <laughs> this... yeah, I bet you didn't think you would be podcasting at 53 either. Nope. Right. I don't think I knew what I was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for something new because the photography industry has changed a tremendous amount. Um, it's very easy to create your own nice photos. It's still right. not as easy as for to do it as I can do it. But 
that's not a very good sales sales point. So <laughs> I needed something to do because if I'm going to live another 50, some 49 years or more, right. right. I got to do something. I can't retire at 53. So <laughs> I started a podcast two years ago. And that's I love great. It. That's yes. wonderful. It's really great. Yeah. And well, I love what you're doing with it. I think, uh, getting more education out there, helping people understand what resources, uh, you know, as I shared with you, I really love how much you're sharing about your story with your mom as painful as that can be folks like me that are not at that stage with my situation, um, learning about things. So thank you for all you do and sharing this out. And, and that's really what I'm hoping to do as well, whether it's as a volunteer or starting Remember, is really try to educate people because it, it sucks to see somebody that you love so much go through this. Um, but like you said, make lemonade, right? I share with you the phrase that uh, my friend Judy shares is that, you know, you have can't really control the cards that you get, but you have an obligation to play the hell out of the cards that you have. And so I think we're both trying to do that uh, and trying to make the world a better place as a function of what we're going through and hopefully help flatten the curve for others out there that might be genetically uh, predisposition to get the diseases. Definitely. My go original goal was to impart the wisdom I had already learned and it didn't take too long to use that up. And so then I had to start talking to other people <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and right. I've learned a lot and just having the podcast has helped me because now I have people I can reach out to, you know, right. like my mom fell and broke her leg and do we do the surgery to pin the bones back together or, you know, and those are very difficult decisions to make because I feel like I'm making decisions for her that she should right. have input on. She has, you know, I tried to ask her and <laughs> I explained what happened and I explained that she should do surgery, but you know, I, I tried to keep it really simple. Like you're talking to a five-year-old. It didn't right. do any good. I figured I'd try. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. I didn't expect much, but I thought, well, let me at least try. But yeah. having people to reach out to helped me a lot. And one right. of the reasons for a podcast instead of a blog or a book or something else was because it's 24 seven. You want to hear my story about tea or brain bars or the canine caregivers, or I've done one on, um, alive inside, which is the music. I have another yeah. music. Um, I love alive inside. Yeah. I have another one that I have to edit. It's uh, music is self care. So, you know, there's just, if you've got a question in almost two years, I've probably touched on it. it. And if yep. I, if you have a question and I haven't touched on it in over a hundred episodes, <laughs> shoot me an email. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Cause I'm always looking for ideas. They, they do pop into my head when I'm riding my bike though. There you go. Right. <laughs> well, this has been great. I look forward yeah. to trying both flavors of bars. I will, Thank I will you. not, I will not just be a, a, you know, prejudiced to the chocolate one. <laughs> And I will definitely share them with my cycling group because they're, um, you know, they're all pretty, try to eat healthy, but they also need it to be easy. So, right. and yep. they're always and some part of the goal. Awesome. Well, thank you.